sort of consequentialist ethic. And so one worry uh, about Reagan's strategy is that it's a conditional proof, and if humans, if it turns out humans don't have rights, then the whole basis for the animal rights argument collapses. Okay. So if the case for human rights collapses, then the case for animal rights built upon it also collapses. Suppose humans do lack rights. Would it follow we can do just anything we want to other human beings? Would it follow that there's absolutely nothing we could do to a human that would wrong that human? Of course not. If the case for human rights collapses, all that would follow is that we would have to account for our, du our direct duties to human beings in some other way. Let us now consider what, if anything, would follow regarding our treatment of animals if it turned out that both humans and animals lack rights. Okay, so another strategy would be, okay, if we can't account for our duties to humans by appeal to rights, and then extend that notion to animals, because humans don't have rights, then perhaps we will have to look to a utilitarian kind of ethic, a consequentialist ethic, to defend our views about um, how to treat human beings. So I want to briefly look at, um, I'm going to have to go, I'm going to have to speed up here. Um, I'll briefly look at Ray, uh, uh, Singer's argument. Utilitarianism, as I touched on before, is the view that an action is, is morally right for a person if and only if out of all the actions available to that person, that action A is the one that maximizes pleasure and minimizes pain for all those affected by the action. I've already, uh, speciesism is the view that one's own species is superior to the other species and that therefore one has a right to dominate those other species. S uh, Singer contends that that's just an unjustified prejudice akin to racism or sexism. And the final term, sentience is the capacity for suffering and or enjoy, uh, enjoyment. We've already touched on that. And then the last preliminary to, before we look at Singer's argument, um, is where most of our food comes from. Um, that most of our food today comes from factory farms. Factory farms are intensive confinement facilities where animals are forced to live their entire lives. Now here I think the United States um, is leading the way for this kind of massive intensification and exporting that technology around the world. Um, but it is rapidly being adopted worldwide. So in the United States, 98% of all chickens are raised in sheds containing over 100,000 birds. In this setting, the birds cannot develop a natural pecking order or hierarchy, so they end up trying to peck each other to death. The industry deals with this with a process called de-beaking, where their beaks are cut off with a scalding hot blade so they can't peck each other to death. Layer hens are raised in battery cages, six to nine birds per cage. On average, eight to 12% of birds die in their cages from these conditions per laying cycle. Uh, I understand that these cages are being phased out in the European Union by the year uh, 2000, 2012, but they're still in practice right now. Um, confined, hogs are confined uh, intensively. In these tight quarters, hogs will try to bite the tails of the pigs confined with them to prevent this. Their tails are cut off um, without anesthesia. Also to limit aggression, they're castrated. The males are castrated, again, without anesthesia. Turkeys are raised in the same kinds of intensive ways. Veal calves are raised in crates where they're unable to move. Um, at least in the United States, they're raised in total darkness, 22 hours a day. The lights are on only for feeding times. Um, and they're fed an anemic diet so that the flesh will be a pale, wh palish white color rather than a, a, a iron-filled red color. Okay, so Singer's argument. It's practically impossible to eat meat without supporting factory farming. What's wrong with factory farming, according to Singer, is that such farming causes animals prolonged intense pain and suffering for no good reason. Why for no good reason, according to Singer? Because we can meet all of our nutritional needs, and now there's mounting evidence that we can actually meet them better, with plant-based foods. Pain is pain no matter what being experiences it. If a being suffers, there simply can be no moral justification for not taking that suffering into account. Remember the quote from Schopenhauer, universal compassion is the ultimate basis of morality. 
How does speciesism fit into the argument? Well, Singer tells us, if we consider it wrong to inflict X amount of pain on an orphaned human infant for no good reason, then, unless we're being speciesist, we ought to agree that it's wrong to inflict that same amount of pain on a pig or a chicken for no good reason. Finally, how does utilitarianism fit into the argument? Well, since animals' interests are affected by our di dietary choices, we have to factor animal pain into our decision. Is the animal pain outweighed by some greater gain that could not be achieved in any other way? Well, we know that eating meat is not necessary for survival or good health. Now, granted, people like the taste, so they get gustatory pleasure. But the question is whether gustatory pleasure is sufficient to outweigh all the pain and suffering of the animal. Right? When we kill animals for food, we're sacrificing their most significant interest for a rather trivial interest like a, a particular taste sensation of our own. And more importantly, from the utilitarian point of view, what we have to do is look at all our available options at mealtimes. You can never, from a utilitarian point of view, determine whether an action's right by looking at an action in isolation. And you would be surprised how many philosophers routinely make that mistake. They'll just say, well, would it be better to do this? Uh, or, or, no, you, they look at an action and they say, well, it has this, it produces this much pain, but boy, it produces all this happiness. So it's right. Well, no, what are the other options? Maybe there's another option that has even better balance of happiness over pain. Right? And so one action available to almost all of us living in um, modern societies is eating a meatless meal that we enjoy at just as much, or very nearly as much, right? When we think, how much pleasure do we get from eating meat, we often think, well, we compare that to eating nothing at all. Oh, I got all this pleasure. Boy, before I wasn't eating anything, no pleasure. But suppose you would get some, you know, 100 pleasure units from eating spaghetti with, you know, tomato meat sauce, and 95 pleasure units from eating spaghetti with a marinara sauce. Well, then the difference is only five pleasure units, not a hundred, right? And so the amount of pleasure that we're talking about is really relative. We just go through, uh, there are alternatives. There's a vast amount of pain and suffering that the animals undergo. There are alternatives. And then six, since an action is right, just in case it maximizes pleasure and minimizes pain for all beings affected, out of all alternatives available, and since there are alternatives that don't, contribute to animal suffering in this way, eating meat is almost always wrong. It's wrong when there are alternatives available. Okay, final, final thoughts here that I want to wrap up with. Um, when I was first reading this literature um, and talking to people about this, you know, professional philosophers, you know, we'd be talking over the dinner, usually over a steak, right? And um, they would ask, well, why are you a vegetarian? And I would try to tell them, you know, some of these reasons. They, they would say, well, yeah, but that's just Singer, Singer's arguments based on utilitarianism. And everybody knows utilitarianism is open to objection. You know, and, or you, you, you yeah, but everybody knows Reagan's rights-based theory is open to objection. Until you can come up with a correct moral theory that applies in all circumstances, I'm going to eat whatever I want. Oh, well, gee, you know, that's convenient, right? Since there never has been any agreement about what the correct moral theory is. <laughs> you know, and probably, probably never will be. So that person can go ahead and eat whatever they want forever, right? But you could use the same argument to justify rape. You know? Oh, I was thinking about performing rape. Can you give me a good argument for not? Yeah, well, it would increase, you know, uh, there are other options that would have a better balance of utility. Oh, yeah, but that's utilitarianism. That theory is false. Yeah, well, she has rights. Oh, that's a rights-based view. That theory is false. I wanted a good reason. Well, fortunately, people haven't thought to apply it to that case. So my strategy is to try to come up with an argument that isn't predicated on some highly contentious moral theory that one can simply dismiss with one fell swoop and say, oh, yeah, everybody knows that theory is false. So the real strategy is this. When, when